Welcome to Ask the Horse Live. I'm your host, Michelle Anderson, Digital Managing Editor of The Horse. Tonight, we're talking about preparing for disasters with your horse. Right now, you might not be thinking about natural disasters. Wildfire season out west has been relatively quiet compared to recent years. There's no hurricane currently rushing towards Florida, no national newsworthy flooding in Texas, and no earthquakes in California. Right now, before the literal or metaphorical storm is exactly the right time for us to be thinking about our emergency plans for both ourselves and our horses. To help guide us, we're joined by emergency planning expert, Dr. Rebecca Jimenez Husted, who literally wrote the book on technical large animal rescue. Welcome, Dr. Husted. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Husted, can you help the audience understand uh, your interest and expertise in this area of disaster planning for our horses? Okay. Yeah, I've been learning and researching and teaching about managing various emergencies and disasters for over 25 years. I was in the military for 28 years. That's a different kind of disaster. <laughs> and then our development of large animal rescue. And uh, I see so many situations for both people and horses where just a little bit of awareness um, on how to plan or prevent or mitigate could have changed the outcome to be a lot better for a horse or horses. And of course, the people that are attached to every single horse. I think the bottom line whether we like it or not, is nobody cares about as much about your horse as you do. Nobody else is legally, morally, and ethically responsible for your horse either, except you. It's It all comes down to you. So I really hope to communicate tonight that planning starts and ends with you, and your horse is totally dependent upon you to, to do that planning. Well, I want to give everyone a quick review of our Ask the Horse Live format. Uh, we're going to start with questions that were submitted during registration. If you have questions you'd like to ask live or you'd like a clarification on a response, you can enter it in the chat window in front of you. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as possible during the live event. If you're listening to our archive or podcast and are interested in joining us for a live event so that you can submit questions, you can register to receive our announcements at thehorse.com or visit thehorse.com slash askthehorselive. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Houston, the first question we have is from uh, Carol in Kansas, and she wants to know if every state has an animal response team, and are those teams organized on a national level? Okay, so there is a team um, organized nationwide, and it's mostly veterinarians, veterinary technicians, and specialty emergency responders. Uh, it's a very small team. There are some not, some organizations that are um, involved in disasters, and you can get involved with some of those. They are pretty commonly uh, available. Code 3 would be one. Uh, HSUS has some teams. Uh, ASPCA, there's many other NGOs that have those kinds of teams. Um, at the state level, um, not every single state has an animal response team, although it is a best practice. Um, there may be smaller teams at the sort of local or regional level. You may have a DART, which is a disaster animal response team, or even a CERT, which is technically a human county emergency response team. Some of those are involved in animal issues also because they've realized that humans and people are connected. Um, and those are really good places to start to get information and basic training in just basic emergency and disaster preparedness and response, both for people as well as for animals. Um, you can go to some websites. If you do a little bit of Googling, you'll find some links to various um, things like that. Um, I'm actually sending, I sent some links to these kinds of things to the horse so that they can post some of those. They're going to post them um, for you guys to take a look at. Um, SART, uh, some states are better organized than others. You can imagine if you are in uh, Nevada, you're probably not really going to worry about too many disasters. If you're in Florida, you get aimed at every single year by the hurricane. So they take it a little bit more seriously down there. Um, at the national level, there is an organization of state agricultural um, organizations and some NGOs that works to provide structure to the process of response for some of these big disasters, and that's called NACEP. And we'll give you the link to that as well, which you can join as an individual, but usually it's organizations and they have state representatives for that. And they're trying to make sure that when a big disaster happens, that there is a organized response 
because we always emphasize being part of the organized response instead of just being um, out there on your own. But Carol, your overall point is really great. It emphasizes you've got to plug in locally. You've got to be part of your county emergency. You know, you need to know your emergency manager, your local fire chief, your local sheriff. Um, I, I know a lot of people that don't know those people, and I and I go, why? It's your county, it's your tax dollars, and they work for you. So go find your emergency response organizations locally so that you can build that relationship now. You don't want to be building it on the day of the disaster. So I know, Dr. Hughes said that during the wildfires in California, especially, uh, we saw – uh, UC Davis getting involved, the, the vet school, in some of those rescue efforts. How involved are the universities and the extension offices in providing disaster planning and preparedness for horse owners? Again, it totally depends upon how many disasters they get affected with. California, Florida, uh, Louisiana, Texas, those states take it really seriously, and they have their vet schools pretty well integrated with their um, extension services. Uh, again, in some states, extension, sadly, has just totally gone away. Our, My childhood memories of 4-H and extension were, it was fundamental to my training in the agricultural and horse community, but in many places, it's totally gone away. Um, that, that's a, a whole other subject, but um, you're right. If, you, if your state takes it seriously and they have the organizational structure for that, your veterinary uh, schools are often very involved in some of those kind of things. Our next question is from Kathy in Missouri, and she wants to know if you have any recommendations for how to organize a call-up system for volunteer emergency responders, phone tree, social media. And I want to couch this that I, I know, again, going back to those wildfires in California last year, that there were issues with people making calls out on social media for help, and then uh, too many people showing up with trailers and clogging the roads that firefighters and emergency responders needed to, to be able to pass through to save people and houses. So uh, what are the best methods for communicating during a disaster? Uh, yes, you are correct. Social media is both a blessing and a curse, and for all of the above reasons you just mentioned. Um, there are some apps, there are some uh, social media as far as organizations can use those kind of things, but it does come down to if you're not invested ahead of time in emergency response, uh, basically if, if you aren't there ahead of time and they don't know who you are and you're not part of the team, you're not going to be a spontaneously welcomed person, uh, no matter how much you care, because they want you to care now. <laughs> they want you to get involved now so that you can get some training, you can get uh, equipment, um, and they make sure that you've got the right attitude um, so that in, you know, disasters are a critical time. People are emotional. People are tired. People are working hard. People have been um, you know, affected by the disaster in many ways, and they need to make sure that you understand how to fit as a cog into the wheel of how we do an organized response to disasters. And there are many people that say, oh, you know, but, um, you know, this group showed up and they, they managed to make all these, 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 these um, saves. And I go, yeah, well, you're right, they did. But they also had a person that actually died that was one of their people because he didn't have his basic shot. So we like to um, involve people ahead of time so that they can be uh, organized, they can be part of uh, volunteer groups that are trained, and even basic things, you know, CPR. How many how many people that are involved in these teams don't know CPR and AEDs? The chances that you're going to run into a person in your lifetime that you may have to save with CPR is pretty high. So I love horses, but we really ought to have even basic CPR to be able to take care of the others around us. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and CPR and first aid just for being around horses and people with horses <laughs> that can get hurt. <laughs> That's right. Um, as well. Exactly. And the number of people that ask me how to do first aid on their ha horse, and I go, but do you know how to do CPR on a kid that falls off and, and has a heart problem? Mm -hmm. and, and they go, what? Mm -hmm. I go, you, you got to reorganize your, uh, your emphasis there. Yeah, I was involved with a therapeutic riding center where the AED got used on a volunteer who had a, mm. a heart incident. Um, and so thankful that, that 
that unit was there um, because not all uh, barns or facilities have that. So um, great point on the training there. Uh, the, the next question we have is from Jennifer in California. And she wants to know if you have any perspectives on establishing a large animal rescue team through the county sheriff's office or other emergency responders. How do you get started in this? Okay, how do you actually get started? There's really not a, <laughs> a perfect way to organize a team. Um, again, it's all about that relationship with your local fire department, your sheriff's office, uh, different ways to organize and fund those kinds of things. Uh, even some of our large animal rescue teams that we have for technical rescue, are, there's no um, rubber stamp way of making a team. Some are privately organized and funded. Others are organized for the fire department, other through the sheriff's office. Um, in some places, it's been organized through a vet school. Some places, it's been organized um, privately. And before Before anybody does anything, really, you need to make those cross coordinations with your local emergency responders. Find out what's actually there. Uh, maybe that's your animal welfare or animal control officers in your county. They may actually have a little team and you don't know about it. Do they have a CERT team? Do they have a DART team? Um, and then the other thing I tell people is before you do anything, make sure that you figure out all the legal, legal implications. And if you are going to buy equipment or if you're going to buy, you know, people buy trailers and they buy dog cages and horse uh, equipment and those kind of things. Who's allowed to use it? Who can borrow it? Do you have a memorandum of understanding or a memorandum of agreement with other organizations? Um, because those things eventually screw up the works for a lot of people. They get all this great equipment and then they nobody's allowed to use it or borrow it uh, because of concerns about like legalities. Um, or somebody ends up using it for their training and nobody else is allowed to use it. And then there's a lot of finger pointing and who paid for it, all those kind of things. So it really needs to be structured out ahead of time. And then, of course, long term, before you even start a team, you need to think about how are you going to maintain training and certification, uh, identification? How do you maintain that over the long term? It's really difficult because we don't have, <laughs> sounds funny, we don't have enough disasters. Unless you live in Florida or California. But if if you don't have enough disasters often enough, people lose interest. And so how do you man, maintain that over time? I was going to say uh, the theme of tonight's questions are California and Florida, because I, those are where <laughs> we got the majority of our questions from um, for good reason. So our next question is from Angela in Florida, and she wants to know, uh, she has a two-part question. She wants to know what are the most important items to have on hand, A, in case of an emergency, and then B, as you try to evacuate. Okay, so let's go back to what FEMA says, and there are free online classes from FEMA that anyone can take. There's three of them it's called Animals in Disasters, Animal Communities in Disasters, and Livestock in Disasters. And actually, Jennifer, I did not send you those links, but I will. It's all about risk assessment and hazard analysis. For example, if I live in Georgia, like I do, I don't worry about earthquake planning. I don't worry about tsunami planning. But if you live in Oregon on the coast, you need to worry about those kinds of things. Um, so it all comes down to where you live and what your lifestyle is or what you do with your horses. You have to tailor your plan to you. So FEMA calls it an all hazards plan. And their point is you don't have to have a separate tornado plan and a separate earthquake plan simply because most people need an evacuation plan and a stay at home, stay at, stay at shelter in place kind of plan. So your horse is depending on you to have that plan for your shelter in place, which really needs to be part of your normal care for the horse. Um, you know, you can lose power at any time, and that can be an emergency for some people. Um, so power alternatives, and that includes everything from having an inverter in your truck so you can charge your cell phone, uh, communications, uh, a weather radio. When I grew up, everybody had what NOAA weather radios. These days, I walk in people's homes and they don't have them. And I'm like, where's your weather radio? They look at me like i am got three heads. Um, it's important. It's nice to have your apps on your phone. But if your phone goes down, it sure is nice to be able to know what's going on with the weather radio. And then, of course, your basic water, food, and emergency kits. And emergency kits really come down to whatever you need to have make yourself happy. For some people, it's medication. For some people, it's clean underwear. Whatever's important to you needs to be in that emergency kit. So tailor it to yourself. 
And then, of course, hand tools, duct tape, hay string, and zip ties um, for your, the things that you need to fix around the house. Maybe you don't have power, so you end up having to, to tie things up and just make it work. Um, things get broken. Um, if you're going to evacuate, then I would say basically all of those above things. And then have you made a list now of what you would have to do when you have to leave the house? Now, that sounds crazy, but I leave the house a lot to travel, and I have a list to you know, change the AC, uh, whatever else is specific to your house, turn off the whatever, turn on the whatever. Um, copies of your paperwork and insurance that have to do with your home, have to do with um, you know, important paperwork that, sh that may blow away or, or get destroyed in, in flooding or whatever. All that needs to be in a folder. And FEMA will tell you the same thing, have copies of all that, probably ought to have it at the bank as well in a safe deposit box. Um, fuel for your vehicle, cash, and extra fuel. It's notorious with horses that people try to evacuate and they run out of fuel on the side of the interstate with their horses and 100 degrees. Uh, we don't want that to happen to you. What are your exit routes? Do you know, especially when we think about wildfires and hurricanes, you need to make sure that you've got uh, alternate exit routes. And then um, are you loading your horse in a safe trailer in the first place and a place to go that's coordinated ahead of time? So you're not just getting in the trailer and leaving and hoping that you can find a place to put your horses. That's not fair to you or them. And then lastly, part of something that we don't think about a lot of times is having a reunion and recovery plan. So you go here with your horses and your husband takes a few other horses and they end up somewhere else. And your mama went over here and where's your kids? They were at school. Somebody picked them up from school. How do you all get back together? And how do you communicate? That's, uh, that's something that FEMA has really put a lot of effort into lately. And, uh, you know, if you actually do it, if you walk through your plan, write your plan down, make these lists, it will probably scare you. It's a sort of a sobering thing to think about if I had to walk out of my house and it's not going to be there when I come back, what would I actually take? Are you going to take your, your parents' ashes? Um, you know, people have different things that they want to take, but, um, it really at that point is em emphasized on, on your list ahead of time so that you know what's important and you don't forget. So you mentioned fuel for evacuating and I think that's something that's important because it's if you have a big uh, heavy duty pickup like I do, like it hurts to fill it up. <laughs> like, <laughs> but I find especially... Yeah. <laughs> it hurts to fill it up, but five gallon tanks in the back, it takes a lot of them to fill that 35 gallon yeah. tank. <laughs> yeah. So I know for me during wildfire season, especially, I never get below half a tank in, in my pickup. Uh, do you have, I don't know if that's the right thing to do. That's just what I do. Do you have recommendations for how much fuel pe horse people should there's, keep? There's really not vehicle? any recommendation. I will tell you that um, those plastic things to put your fuel in are pretty cheap and it doesn't hurt to I what I do at home is I have 35 gallons that I run through and I cycle through it so it doesn't get old or stale and um, water in it and those kind of things so I always have 35 gallons of fuel in my garage in those safety cans that I just rotate through for all of my of course I got three Dodge trucks but that's probably a pretty good idea and then if you put them in the back of your truck you need to make sure you tie them in so they're not flying around um, okay. when you're when you're doing those things. You know, there actually, Michelle, there is two kinds of people in the world. They're the ones that <laughs> say, I think, I think I need to fuel up at half a tank. And then they're the ones that are like, Hey, I'm good. I've driven this thing before. I know what's going on. <laughs> yeah, not, not with horses in the trailer. It stresses me out. So. <laughs> I'm the first type. Um, so our next question is from Kim in Arizona. And she wants to know when taking a horse with you, uh, is not possible during a wildfire, is fixing uh, an ID to the horse and turning the horse loose the best option? Okay, let me talk about ID first. Um, I am a big fan of ID. I'm a big fan of internal ID for anything, simply because that's the best way to prove that it's your, your animal and uh, so stolen horses and all those kinds of things. So by internal, um, do you mean a microchip or microchip. a brand? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes, ma'am. And then external ID, I like brands. And if you've got to use a temporary version, that's fine. Uh, but let's talk about letting your horses loose. 
a lot of people don't like this answer, but I tell them, I say, you know, is there any time in the whole time that you've owned your horses that you've ever just let him loose and hoped he survived in, in your suburban environment? We don't do that. First of all, you go to jail because your horse is going to get hit by a car or he's going to end up in somebody else's yard and hurt somebody. Um, but there's just that that is just not an alternative. I know people do it. I know that that seems to be the last uh, minute thing that people do with horses. And, and I, I just have to ask and I, I look and I, I learn. I, I pay attention to what's going on in these fires. And I understand that sometimes people literally only have minutes to deal with that. And in that situation, I think it's more about your family than it is about your horses. And I guess that's what you got to do. But after I have seen the pictures and videos of so many animals that got, that were let loose, they run into another fence line or they get trapped in somebody else's um, place uh, or obstacles. And the, the, you can't imagine the heat and the pain and the fear that the toxic smoke that those animals are breathing in. And we find them um, dead. We find them horrifically injured they get hit by vehicles um, driven by fire trucks sometimes they get hit by fire trucks um, in these situations or they run back into something that they can't get out or, or they get in an entrapment and that's what I ask people to do is you really I call it the candy crush situation don't be playing the don't be playing candy crush you need to be paying attention in fire weather for what's going on how close is the fire and when are you going to evacuate and I have a hashtag that I use in my classes, and we have a saying. We say, there is no such thing as premature evacuation. Uh, so hashtag premature evacuation. But it really emphasizes that there's really, um, that's not fair to your animal. It's not fair to the people that are responding in the area to dealing with the fire or whatever kind of disaster you're dealing with. Um, you need to find a better way. Yeah, so this is such a tough one. Um, so if you are leaving your horses behind and you have a fire coming through and your choices are between turned out in your pasture or in a barn, would you recommend that they go out in the pasture? Out in the pasture. So when that does happen, uh, at least they know your your facility. So what many people have done is they have made an arena or some place that is not going to burn with the flames, but your horses are going to endure a horrific amount of heat. They're going to endure the toxic smoke. And when you can get back to those horses, you are going to have to take them to a vet. Even if they look like they're fine on the outside, it's the inside that gets burned. And I guess that's a good point about having an arena if you have a non-combustible footing like yep. sand, and then yep. that would probably be the safest yep. place on and it. Even, you know. Even burn, even uh, pre-burn-offs in Australia uh, in fire season, um, they do pre-burn-offs ahead of time around their facilities so that there's nothing there to burn when the fire actually comes. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, has to be coordinated with the Forest Service. If you live in California, they're pretty good at doing that. They will actually, Cal Fire will come to your place and they will do a plan with you. Um, and they will, they will tell you the things you don't want to hear. Those kind of bushes need to go. You need to put in Xeriscape. You need to take that stuff out and put in rock. It's going to be the stuff you don't want to hear. But the reason they say those things, um, all that uh, fire fire prevention stuff, is because they know that it's that uh, those little fines will will get that fire when that little tiny um, cinder lands. It will start a fire right next to your barn. Well, and I know, like for us, in uh, I'm in the high desert of Oregon, and it's hard to limb up those trees. Um, and I think it was after the last time you and I did one of these types of <laughs> events together, we, the next time it was a uh, fire free time here, my husband and I were out limbing up trees and, and it's, you know, it, it's a sacrifice and a compromise uh, to lose some of mm -hmm. your vegetation around your house, but um, the, it, it's worth it for the peace of mind. Mm -hmm. So um, Lauren's in our live audience. She was just asking about turning horses out. If you have 30 acres, uh, but she's followed up and said that that you've answered her question. So horses horses go out. Arena would be a good choice, someplace with yep. the least amount of fuel. So yep. that they feel comfortable, they have water until you can get back to them. Because remember, it may be a couple of days so you can get back to them. Um, California's done a pretty good job. Halter with uh, Juliet Wood and her folks, uh, John Moretti and those folks, they have worked really hard to make sure that they're doing the outreach. They actually send teams out to people's places that did the shelter in place, and they're providing water 
um, making sure that the animals are okay when the owners aren't are not allowed to go back yet. Um, but that's that is man, that's a whole other level of preparedness that many communities are not ready for. Um, our next question is from Margaret in California. Margaret wants to know if it's safe to leave a leather halter on her horses if she has to leave them. If you have to, um, a leather or a breakable halter is absolutely the preferred thing because um, you know how horses are. They can get themselves trapped and, and then they panic on anything. And there's some pretty horrific pictures out there on Google of, of those kind of things. Although I say, um, why are you putting a halter on the horse in the first place? Is it because you can't catch him? Um, is it because you're afraid somebody else might have to catch him? Uh, think through why you're leaving a halter on the first place. Um, in any of these kinds of things, I always tell people it's amazing how many horses can do um, a sliding stop, a pee off, a pee stop, whatever else they do, but they don't come on command. They don't allow themselves to be haltered calmly. Um, that's practice. That's taking the effort to to work with your horse. It's not magic. You know, I know there's a lot of natural horsemanship folks that have taken it to an amazing level of excellence. The horses can come to them from five miles away, but anybody can learn basic getting your horse to come on command and allowing itself to be haltered. Um, and of course, you should teach, let anybody um, get used to handling your horse, like all the folks that work at your barn. So you bring up a good point about being able to catch the horses. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to a question about how important it is it that your horse know how to load in load in general in a trailer that they're not familiar with as well and with people that they don't know. Have you ever noticed how people brag that they're the only one that can do anything with their horse? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they really don't like it when I say, you know, that's the very last one that I'm going to be trying to catch and load if you're so proud of it that it doesn't catch anyway. Um, you're right. So let me just say this. Loading your horse is a crucial skill. Uh, to me, it is a lot more important than a sliding stop or a counter canter or any other thing that he can do. It is the most important thing. He should load no matter what. Um, I don't have a specific number or a percentage. But I'll tell you that every vet and every tech that I've ever talked to, they tell stories about the horses that they have to go and actually provide emergency services at the farm simply because the horse wouldn't load and it's colicking or it's got something stuck through it. Um, and they lose time because they end up having to respond to that. So I tell people that the biggest emergency your horse is ever going to have to deal with is going to be um, something horrific for which they need to get on the trailer to save their own life. And that means we have to teach them ahead of time. Uh, I have a rule with responders when we go out to do these things in emergency situations. Um, I tell them, you know, if it if it's harder than calling the horses with a bucket of feed and putting a halter on them, they're probably going to end up sheltering in place um, because we'll, we're going to go catch the horses that are easy to catch and that are easy to load on a trailer. I give a horse three minutes to load on a trailer. Um, in these kinds of emergency situations, if it can't get on a trailer in three minutes, um, then it's going to be left behind, which is awful, and it means they may die. But we're going to go help the other horses that are willing to get on the trailer because people have taken their time to teach the horse to get on the trailer. And that means the horse has to go on any kind of trailer. I, I get so sick of hearing the excuses that my horse doesn't step on to ramps. My horse doesn't like plant loads. My horse doesn't like forward faces. My horse doesn't, doesn't like this. And I go, it's, it's not that your horse doesn't like those kind of trailers. It's because you've never taught him to load. A horse should load no matter what on any kind of trailer when you ask. Oh. And I think that an easy solution to that is when you go out riding with your friend, sometimes you pick them up and sometimes they pick you up. And that's something that I do with my horses, just partly for that reason, partly to share gas. That's simple. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, that's an easy, yeah. that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Um, we have a question from the live uh, audience following up on leaving horses behind uh so Sarah wants to know about leaving horses on irrigated pastures. So the recommendation is sometimes to turn on your irrigation if you live in a, an area with with water rights. Um, right. Is that a good option or is that water going to be there if the power goes out? So that's the problem, right? So if you've got excellent dripping wet vegetation, you're probably not going to have the problem with those uh, fires that are miles away and are just dropping some cinders in your pasture, um, but if the water stops, 
and uh, the temperatures are high, uh, which they usually are in fire season, and there's low humidity, that pasture may dry out very quickly. Um, in those cases, what some people have done is they've just mowed it really, really low, and that's a, that may be a, a, an, an easy way to do that too. And I've also seen some really good videos where people were literally plowing the fields um, as the fire was moving in the direction of their cattle. And that was their last ditch effort, but they were literally making uh, fire stops with um, plows. So uh, I guess it's not a bad thing to have irrigated fields, but you gotta have power. And a lot of people don't have alternate power sources. If you've got an alternate power source for your pump, then that's probably not such a bad idea. Uh, we have a question from Valerie in California, and she wants to know if my horse gets burned and the vet is not available, what's the best first aid option? And so, and I'm going to couch this with the the fact that uh, Dr. Houston, you have doctor in front of your name, but you're a PhD, right. not a vet. I don't know that we made That's that clear at the, at the beginning. Um, so, so we can't offer treatment options, but we can offer right. some. some Emergency right. first aid. I, I tell people all the time I'm an AEDT member and a veterinary technician, and I'm going to remind you that a veterinary technician, is, veterinary veterinarian for equines, is the best source of information on first aid for burns. And the real reason is it's not the external burns that they're really going to be concerned about unless the horse is burned over a huge percentage of its body. It's the stuff you can't see. It's the destruction to their lung tissue. It's toxic smoke. It's heat. Um, those two things combined together. Uh, all the the horrific things that animals end up breathing in. It's very common for animals exposed to the smoke, even at lower levels, to have complications from breathing it. Um, you know, we put on masks when it gets nasty for us, and this is probably, you know, the smoke is probably one of the best reasons for evacuation well before the fire, um, because if it is, it's affecting you, it's affecting them, and that means your pets, your horses, everybody else, they have to breathe it too. And their respiratory systems are just as sensitive as ours. Um, our next question is from Kay in California, and she wants to know, how do you protect a horse's respiratory system when leading them out of a hot smoke-filled wildfire area? Okay, good. That goes along with that previous question. So if anybody knows of a really good method, I'd like to know also. Okay, <laughs> I've seen a lot of homemade efforts. Um, there is not currently a marketed product for masks for horses um, that I can recommend. There's a couple of people that have tried something. Um, it's not appropriate. The challenge really is fit. It has to be a really good fit. It means a tight fit, and you can imagine the horses don't really like that um, on their face. People have tried, you know, everything from wet washcloth to uh, homemade masks. And usually what happens is the horse either sort of claws it off, rubs it off, um, or gets very ag agitated when they uh, you apply it because it's something they're not used to. Um, so it really comes down to a management de decision. Um, you know, there's some things that you could do if the fire was a long way away and it wasn't too much smoke. But uh, the fires last year in British Columbia, Canada, we were smelling them in Georgia because the jet stream was picking that up and moving it straight to Georgia. And my eyes were stinging, which means my horse's eyes were stinging, and we're 4,000 miles away. So um, smoke advisories are something we have to pay attention to. I would not be exercising my horses under smoke advisories. I would be being really careful um, uh, on how early that I evacuated my horses from those kinds of things, from heavy smoke. Um, you know, and some animals are really, I'm not a veterinarian, but some animals are really sensitive to asthma. They have reactions. They can have secondary complications, um, even in low areas of smoke, animals that have those kinds of conditions. Um, and then, of course, any animal, if you do save something from a heavy smoke area and you're able to lead it out or put it on a trailer and get it out, you really need to take it to a veterinarian. They will look at it for prophylactic treatment because some things that they can do those first 24 to 48 hours after an animal's been exposed to heavy smoke that may save the animal. It may not be um, able to be used for really heavy duty the rest of its life, but at least it can save the animal. But if you wait uh, two days, three days, uh, the animal will just collapse from uh, that internal damage. Yeah. Our next question is from Diane in California, and she wants to know how do you handle the evacuation of a boarding facility when there are more horses than trailers? <laughs> this is a good one. Okay, 
So I call it boarding and trailering math. <laughs> and I, I say, okay, how many horses do you have and how many spaces and trailers do you have? And a lot of people, they raise their hands and they say, um, I don't have as many spaces as in the trailers as I do horses. And I go, well, which ones are you going to leave behind? And that's really sobering. So that's really what it comes down to. It's a prioritization thing. If you're boarding your horse at a barn, um, you want to make sure your horse gets out. You need to have a plan for your horse, which means you need to talk just seriously with your management um, and the other boarders and have a plan for how you're going to get those things out. Because when I'm talking to boarding um, owners, I'm telling them it's a prioritization thing. The easy to catch and the easy to load and the easy to handle horses, in my world, those go on the trailers. In other people's world, they worry about the most valuable insurance-wise. In other people's world, they're like, that's my 32-year-old horse that I've had since I was a little girl, and he may be a little arthritic and slow, so he's going on the trailer first. Whatever your priority is, is, is what needs to be the plan. But everybody needs to know the plan, because I promise you, that will be a serious litigious issue after the fire if three horses get left behind because there wasn't space for them, but the management never told anybody. So um, now, having said that, you know, we all know people that can fit six horses into a four horse trailer. Now, <laughs> I am not advocating that because we all know that those are not really safe things to do, um, but under duress, uh, a lot of people have done those kind of things. So it really comes down to, can you run a trailer for the disaster period? Are there other trailers that can be coordinated? Is there somebody out of the area that can come get your trailer, get your horses ahead of time, well ahead of time? There's a veterinarian I met many years ago down in Florida, and she had a plan for about 20 of her um, clients, and they had actually pre-rented a large horse transport, and they, every single time they had a hurricane, they came down, picked up her and her client's horses, and they moved them up to someplace in North Georgia, and they were up there usually for a week while the hurricane was doing its thing, and then they'd take them back. And I was like, man, that's really expensive. She said, yep, it ran, it ran about $1,000 per person. And she said, you know what, that's cheap insurance. And I was like, I can't argue with that. Yeah. So do you recommend that boarding facilities especially run evacuation drills? Oh, yes. Oh, I would love it if people did that. It is so difficult to get people to actually do that. So let me tell you why. Because you've got a horse, Michelle, mm -hmm. Four. and your horse has waste, wasted, waited her entire life to kill Jennifer's horse. Mm -hmm. Okay? They're all in the same stable, and your horse has been plotting and planning for years and years to try to kill somebody else's horse because she hates her, because she's next door to her, but she can't bite her. So if you go do an evacuation drill and you're, you know, under duress, you're trying to load horses and these kind of things, is it possible that somebody could get hurt? Is it possible that one horse could end up next to another horse and they could end up getting kicked or bitten or those kind of things? Of course it is. And that's why people don't actually, actually do it. So if you do it, you should time it and you should um, do it under not duress so that everybody can sort of sort out what is going on and figure out places where you can save time in your structure. For example, the most important um, time saver to me is to have your truck loaded, hitched, and fueled at all times if you're under catastrophic fire conditions. If you have to buy another truck, then that's what you do. That's, that's just what you do. If you look over to Australia and you look at what they do under those catastrophic fire conditions, that's what they do. Um, cause honestly, I know a lot of people that it takes them 10 or 15 minutes to actually hit their trailer. I, uh, I sent a, I sent a link to the horse screamers video on hitching your trailer to Jennifer to upload. And it's funny, but it's sad because we all have seen people do that. It takes forever to hitch the trailer and they're screaming at each other and all those kind of things. So, um, if you actually do it, so if you actually do it, and this is not just your horses, it's also your other animals and your kids and all the other things that you need to do because you're evacuating because there's not going to be anything there when you come back, possibly. So if you actually do it, it takes a lot longer than you think it does. Um, we've done it before. And the first time my ex-husband, Tomas, that did all the TLR stuff with me in the beginning and got this going, um, we, we were ready. We thought we had everything prepared. We had our go bags. We had all these stuff and it still took a lot longer than we thought it would take. 
to actually do it. Actually get everything, hitch the trailer, put everything in the trailer, and leave out the front gate. It, it Time it. It'll scare you to death because you look at these folks out in California um, or in some of these other disasters that are of a time crunch kind of nature, and they've got 20 minutes. They've got 10 minutes, and uh, that's a very short period of time. And it's, you know, I also remind people that they should be evacuating, drill, doing evacuation drills from the barn in case of barn fire. Um, there was a gal out in Oregon I was talking to last year, and she was in a snow overload situation in her barn, and they started hearing the barn creaking. They were able to un evacuate all the horses and people, um, it's a therapeutic center, out of the barn in less than two minutes, thank goodness, because the entire roof fell in. So if that happened to you right now, do you know how to get all your horses out of your barn in two minutes or less? That's actually really difficult to do. So, um, you know, it's, it, evacuation from anything is very difficult. It, I tell people to Google horse trailer fire in images on Google, and you'll see why uh, you ought to even practice unloading and evacuating your horse trailer. Um, the number of horse trailers that burn on the interstate is amazing. Um, and that's one of the most stressful places you could ever have to unload your horse. And I wanted to note for our listeners in the future who are listening to our podcast or our archive, Jennifer's horse, who would be maybe kicking my horse, but actually my mare would be more likely kicking hers, is our web producer. And she's behind the scenes, and she's been sending links out to the live audience. And if you want to join us live uh, at some point in the future, go to thehorse.com slash live to register for our uh, alert so that you can be part of the live action of our, our Ask the Horse Lives. Um, Dr. Husted, our next question is from our our live audience. Allison wants to know, in the winter, at what point should I be concerned about snow buildup on my barn's roof? So you just mentioned the, the roof collapsing. What's the safest yeah. scenario for my horse in extreme snow conditions? Evacuate or shelter in place? Oh, that's a good one. Okay, so really it comes down to how old is your barn and what kind of construction uh, is it made out of? Uh, you can actually ask some of your local firefighters. They can give you some advice on that, but you may have to actually find a engineer or architect um, that's familiar with uh, design of these buildings. The problem that we have is many of our structures are older, and you know, no matter whether it's made out of wood or metal, over time it does start to deteriorate a little bit, um, depending on how much maintenance you've provided to the facility. And the second one is over the last 40 years or so, we've used a lot of what we call lightweight wood construction. And often these facilities are built for a minimum snow load. Uh, they don't build them for a maximum snow load. So for example, last year in Oregon, they were getting feet of snow. I know right now in the Rockies, um, they're getting feet of snow um, for which your facility may not have the correct angle to be able to have that snow slide off. Um, or you may not have the warmth in the building that causes that uh, to slide off easily. So to me, if I was concerned about it, I would like to have my horses outside of that structure. That's a tough call for some of these um, horses that are, you know, blanketed and clipped and all those kind of things. That's a tough call. But uh, under the 24 or 48 hours of the actual event, if you have concerns, I would uh, put my horses outside. We have a question from Samantha in Washington, and she wants to know how much feed do you need to take with you if you're evacuating? Okay, the whole thing about I'm not a vet, but I'll tell you um, that in the vet nutritionists usually recommend that changes be accomplished over um, many days or a couple of weeks. And, you know, a lot of horses are very sensitive to diet changes. You can actually cause colics and those kind of things. So I would prefer that you take enough to be able to switch them over to get where you're going, and then, of course, be able to switch them over to whatever feed or hay that they're going to have at the other place. But then when you're bringing them back, you've got to switch them back just as carefully. So that is a pain in the butt. To me, I would like to have enough of my stuff to keep them going for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. They're getting the same feed and the same hay, which means you got to take a bunch of stuff. and. Um, Man, that, that becomes the math on that one for a couple of horses for a couple of weeks becomes a lot of, of um, your hay and feed that's got to be transported. And I'm sorry about that. And if you, if you can't do that, then you got to switch them. 
but uh, the the vet can give you the best best information on that, and a veterinary nutritionist is probably who you really need to talk to. Yeah, and I think it would also depend on what kind of natural disaster you're facing. So if you have a hurricane that's coming in and you have some warning, um, right. maybe you're able to load up where if you have a lightning strike near your house and you have a fire, you're loading up and out of there, maybe without that's grabbing right. extras. That's right. So. Yeah. We have a question from Justine in Oregon, and she wants to know what minimal paperwork is required to move a horse to safety. And I know we saw during the last hurricane uh, in Florida that Florida lifted some restrictions and the states around Florida lifted restrictions for transporting horses and paperwork. So what paperwork should you have ready at the ready if you need to evacuate over state lines? Okay, so exactly. So actually, Florida and those other states in the southeast, they've had so many disasters that they've got really gotten pretty good at doing that. And it's specific things um, for specific animals, and it's only waived for a very short time, um, mostly to encourage people to evacuate. They don't want you saying, oh, well, I'm not going to evacuate because I haven't got a Coggins test um, or I don't have a health certificate. Uh, but you will, if you screw around too long outside of the state, you're going to end up having to get one before you come back into the state. So that is, it, it's not carte blanche is what I'm saying. Um, to me, the vets can give you the absolute answer for each individual state because every state is different. But to me, you need proof of a negative Coggins test. You need your proof of vaccinations and you need proof of identification for your horses. And those three things are the keys to the kingdom for most people, um, even if, you were uh, trapped coming out of a out of a state or trying to get back into your state. Those three things will will probably give you everything you really need. How useful is a photograph of your horse to help identify it in case you get separated at an evacuation facility? It is best that you have a picture of you and your horse. I would like to have many many pictures of you and your horse um, with you in the picture um, at different times of year. Um, close-ups of their different identification, you know, the whorls, the, uh, the, the stripes, whatever it, it, special things that it might have on it, um, uh, markings that are different, its brand. I, I, there's so many places in the, in the East that we don't use brands, and I'm a big fan of using a cold brand um, to provide that external ID and a microchip. Okay. So you mentioned having photos of you with your horse. Why would that be important? Um, because it proves that you've been with the horse, and uh, if somebody else, for whatever reason, your horse ends up in a facility and somebody else is saying, hey, that's my horse, um, it increases the chances of you being able to say that that's my horse. Of course, the best way is to have a microchip in the horse and prove it by having a, a microchip scan, and you've got the, the papers that show that it's your horse with a microchip in it. So how Sadly, you got to remember that there's a lot of people that take advantage of disasters. We most of us don't want to think about that way, but there's a lot of people that when a disaster comes along, that's like, woohoo, this is the best time for me because I can, I can steal horses. I can do all kinds of crazy things. And that's what I was going to ask. Is it people who with bad intentions taking horses or is it sometimes people who are confused and under stress and claiming an animal that isn't theirs because they really believe it's theirs? They really do believe it's theirs sometimes. And sometimes there's a, you know that that whole um, psychological thing, and for some people, you know, if you if your horse has been in in a disaster like some of the horses that they pull out after a couple of weeks of being in flooding or um, after a hurricane, uh, your horse doesn't look like it did. It's uh, a lot skinnier, it's a lot scruffier, all those kinds of things, and you may not even recognize your own horse. And that's one of the other reasons you want to have all those good pictures. Uh, our next question is from Christine in Texas, and she wants to know what should be your plan for torne tornado season with horses? Okay, this is another one of those ones where it's, um, I, I think a lot of people probably saw that woman a few years ago, I think it was in Texas, she went viral with her photo photos of the tornado shelter for her horses, and that was awesome. Uh, the neat idea, it's probably really expensive, I'm not sure how applicable it, it really is because sometimes you don't have that much time to to deal with um, getting your horses and putting them into a shelter. But uh, tornadoes are really dangerous to people. And really it comes down to, um, it's, I'm not trying to be mean, but people come first. In emergency management, we talk about people first and then animals. 
So you got to get yourself and your kids and your neighbors and your small pet and all those kind of things into safety and sort of let the horses figure it out. Now, obviously, it's easier for them to, quote, figure it out if you have a choice of where you want to be if you're a horse. So if you've got a huge pasture and you've got lots of choices and you can go behind a tree or you can go down into a ditch or those kind of things, um, that gives you a lot more choices than a horse that's stuck in a 100 by 100 flat paddock. Um, if you've got a run-in or a stall um, with an attached paddock, so you've got a place that you can choose. Um, animals are really pretty amazing at surviving even catastrophic situations. That's why horses turn their butts to the wind, because they know that the, the muscle in their rear end can take some of those pretty nauseating injuries. Um, but I will say that after the tornado, you may need to be prepared to transport your horse to the vet, because if it gets those kinds of injuries, you're going to need to take it in and get um, those kind of things sutured up. Our next question is from Jen in Kentucky, and she wants to know what are your top tips for dealing with flash flooding? What uh, do you do if you can't get to your horse? Okay. Um, this is all really about prevention. You have to make sure that pastures have a high side so that animals can find it. Uh, flooding really is all about your safety, and, and horses are not dumb. If you give them those opportunities, they will find them. Um, you don't want to lock them in stalls and weather that's predicted to provide rain. And obviously, you know, keep going back to the no weather ready radio and getting the emergency information kind of thing. There's a lot of apps for your phone that people can use, but it really comes down to prevention. Why do we have horses in those kind of, of areas? It's because land is cheaper, because it's a flood zone. There's so many websites where you can find your local flood maps. Uh, FEMA uses them. The insurance companies use them. Everybody else can find them. So why is it we can't find them? There are maps for flooding. Now, that's not particularly for flash flooding, but if there is an area that is particularly notorious for flash flooding, you can find that by talking to your local emergency managers also. They'll tell you, you know, I just moved to this area. Um, is there any flash flooding that happens in my area? And they'll tell you if there's uh, an area that you need to be concerned about. But really, it comes down to prevention, making sure that your animals have a, an option. Can they get out of the pasture instead of being trapped in the pasture? Uh, some of you have probably seen that lady in Texas that has had, uh, I don't know, she's lost lots of animals over the last few years, always in the same situation. It's always a, a flash flood situation in, um, in the Houston area. And, and uh, apparently, she doesn't understand that it could happen again next year. Just because it's in a 100-year flood zone doesn't mean it's going to be another 99 years before you have another flood. It's, it's happening a lot more often. It happens in places that it used to not happen. And part of that is because we've covered everything with roof and asphalt and concrete surfaces that don't absorb water, and then it runs downhill. And so the poor rural communities often end up suffering from the urban communities that, that put all that stuff um, over the sand so or over the earth. So... You do have to go look around. You have you do have to be aware, but the best way to do that is talk to your local emergency manager. He'll tell you where areas in your county or your jurisdiction are that are dangerous for uh, previous flood. Our next question is from Lynn in Oregon, who wants to know how can you make sure your horse has a fresh water source during an emergency? Okay. Fresh water is a big deal. Um, right now, actually, there's uh, I saw a uh, flyer from Halter, they're a group, that group that I said promotes preparedness and mitigation, and they are talking about the PG&E power outages um, in, for, you know, because of wildfire right now. And really that comes down to, if you think about, that's another scary math problem. If a horse uses 10 to 15 gallons of water a day, um, assuming he doesn't knock over his bucket, um, if you've got three horses, that's 45 gallons a day just to provide good drinking water. Um, I'm assuming you don't have a pond or this kind of thing. Um, if you're a big boarding facility that's got 50 horses, that's going to be about 750 gallons a day, which is a fire truck full of water. So where do you put a fire truck full of water? Um, and you're not going to get it from your local fire company because they're going to be out fight, fighting wildfires. Um, if you think about 750 gallons a day, that's a, a bunch of 50 gallon drums and a whole bunch of five gallon buckets. So you got to think about where you're actually going to store it. 
Um, maybe you need to think about having an alternative power source for a pump um, to a cistern or a well. Um, maybe you need to have a small pond on your property just for emergency supplies of water. Horses can drink out of ponds. Um, it may not be the best thing, but it's better than nothing. Um, and really, Michelle, I don't know um, exactly how old you are, but my grandparents, when I was a kid, they taught us to store containers with water for brushing teeth and cooking and flushing toilets. So um, it really goes down to they were talking about preparedness even back then. Yeah, and I one thing that we do is keep uh, water and jugs in the the freezer that we uh, store our <laughs> yep. our meat in. Um, so we fill as we because we buy you know a, a half a cow and a, a pig a year, and then as we go down, we add more because it actually makes the refrigerator or the freezer more efficient. And then we have the additional water right. um, for that. So that's that's our approach. It's also that half empty uh truck tank fuel tank that's I right try to think same, the same way with my water troughs <laughs> them, keep my water troughs full it's hard when you want to scrub them and you don't want to dump over the whole thing but um but yeah keeping those full full as well because for me in the in the desert we don't have a lot of alternative water options um right yeah. So our next question is from Judy in Texas, and Judy wants to know if evacuating takes longer than expected, say, because of traffic, it took 12 hours instead of three hours to move your horses. Um, should you unload your horse at any point during the stretch? Okay. So that goes back to that previous thing about teaching your horses to load. If your horses are, um, you know, everybody always says, don't unload your horses. Don't unload your horses. They'll never go back on. And um, I guess if your horses um, are not used to loading and, and, and unloading and reloading, then you probably shouldn't do that. But uh, if you've practiced with your horse to lead and load and stand tied consistently and you've taken him out in public and he's calm, then why not? I mean, I haul my horses all over the place and um, for training evolutions and for trail riding and, and public events and those kind of things. And I stop at a Starbucks or a rural gas station. I find a place on the backside, it's got a little grass and stuff. Uh, I send the husband in to, to do natural functions and get my coffee. And I unload my horses in a grassy spot and let them graze and they stretch and they pee. And then we switch and he holds them while I go in and do that. Um, and we don't have a problem. I'm very careful where I select, but I also have done a lot of training with my horses. But I can bet you that if I was hauling two-year-old thoroughbreds for somebody else that were insured and I didn't know them and I'd never worked with them, you can bet that I would be stopping in a prearranged place, such as a farm or an arena with fencing, um, in case they got spooked or silly or those kind of things. You certainly don't want to be stopping um, on the side of the interstate or on the side of a road. You want to you want to get off the road. But um, I guess the biggest thing is to understand it comes down to how much training you've done with your animals and pre preparation for, for those kind of things. And you are personally responsible for any damage to property or vehicles that might occur while you have the horses off the trailer. So you do have to do some planning. There's lots of resources out there, even on the internet, as far as um, places to stay overnight, places to stop and rest your horses. And generally, I don't know about you, Michelle, but most horse people are friendly horse people. And if you are driving and you get off the road and you find a horse farm and you pull up and you say, hey, my horses have been on this trailer for four hours, six hours, eight hours, I'd really like to give them a chance to rest because I just put them in your arena for a half an hour. So I guarantee you most people are going to say that's fine. So we've talked about um, tornadoes and wildfire, but we have a question from Diane in Florida who wants to know about hurricanes specifically. What's the most, best location for your horse that's sheltering in place for a hurricane? Uh, anywhere the, the hurricane isn't. <laughs> 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 okay. So, um, you know. So evacuate. Uh, yeah, evacuate really. Uh, you know, it's sort of hard though. I've got a friend of mine and uh, over the last two storms that came to the Georgia area and South Carolina area, um, she had called me and she was planning to bring her horses to my farm. And then she called back and she said, no, I'm going to take them to this place in North Carolina because the storm has changed track. And then at the very last minute, she called me and she said, don't worry about it. I'm just going to keep them at home because apparently the storm is not going to hit here. So she was really panicky for about a week. And that can happen. It's mm -hmm. scary. You watch those things and the storm tracks change a little bit. And all of a sudden you're realizing, hey, the place that I was planning to take my horse is right in the 
in the um, focus of the storm. So it's pretty amazing how good Florida in particular has gotten at um, a hurricane evacuation um, from Irma. They had over 70,000 horses that evacuated and of course millions of people left Florida. Um, that's a lot of horses. That's one of the reasons that they do those things with uh, relaxing some of their restrictions. Um, we know that evacuation is the best practice well ahead of the storm. You don't want to get caught in traffic for hours. You don't want to be running out of fuel. Um, you know, that's that's an awful thing to have happen with horses on the trailer. Uh, sheltering in place, sadly, for some people, you're going to have to do it because of traffic congestion. Many of the folks that I work with in South Florida, they don't really have a choice unless they leave two weeks ahead of time because of all of the evacuation traffic. Um, really, without a well-built barn or a shelter, if you're in a Category 3 or a higher storm, you're going to end up having horrific injuries to animals um, that are left outside or if the buildings get destroyed. Um, if you look at the pictures of the Caribbean storm that hit Dorian, yeah. uh, it's pretty awful. Uh, very few animals can survive those kinds of injuries, even in our in our very um, excellent society as far as providing uh, veterinary care. But, uh, you know, that's that's a tough choice to make, and it comes down to evacuating early, which is tough to do when you have a job and they, they don't understand, oh, you know, I need to leave two weeks early or I need to leave a week early because there's a storm coming. It, it may come down to hiring a professional transporter just to get your horse out of, out of uh, the storm's path. That's a difficult decision. And that's why we also say that part of evacuation planning and uh, disaster planning is having some extra cash uh, saving up for these kinds of things so that you have better options than just doing it at the last minute. Okay. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight. I want to thank Dr. Husted for joining us and for answering all, all the questions. Um, always really great to have you on and uh, and talk about this planning that all of us horse owners should be doing. Well, thank you very much for having me. I hope that everybody will get involved in a local team, at least reach out to your local resources, and hopefully um, do some planning. And if you need any resources, any other resources, you can find me easily on uh, Facebook or on just Google me and I will send me an email and I'll help. Okay. Uh, I also want to thank our audience for tuning in tonight and for those who are listening in the future on the archive and the podcast. I hope you can join us next month. We're going to be talking about caring for young horses. Until then, from all of us here at the horse, have a great night. <laughs>